Hello and welcome to Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name is Jim Rugg. I'm Ed Piscor. Today we're going to look at the classic Mike Mignola Hellboy number one, Seed of Destruction. Before we dive into Hellboy, Ed, you have a comic that probably suits the hell topic. How about that for a crop? Red Room number one. <laughs> the Anti-Social Network trade paperback is going to be hitting the stands in uh, November 9th. Murder on the Dark Web for Fun and Profit is the name of the game, Jimmy. And I added about 70 pages of extra stuff. You could see it all right here, man. you got to make these books look fresh. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> it just can't be simple uh, collections where you don't do any extra work. This is a different reading experience and a potentially different audience of people are going to check this thing out. So on top of the four issues of the Antisocial Network, uh, there's director's commentaries, lots of extra text stuff, character design, sketchbook material... And even a glimpse or two of some forthcoming uh, Red Room comics. Those will be uh, Red Room trigger warnings coming in December. Uh, you can pre-order those comics at the Fantagraphics website. You can order this comic at Fantagraphics as well. Go to your local comic shop. And uh, when though all else fails, you go to Amazon.com. They bought more than half the print run. So uh, it'll reliably be available there until it's not. Uh, but all these links are available in my link tree in the description below this video. You can join me on patreon.com slash Jim Rugg where you can download original where you can download out of print zines and mini comics. You can see original art, scripts, and processes from the comics I make, like Street Angel Deadly Girl Alive, available wherever comics are sold, comic shops, bookstores, online. Uh, perfect book for the upcoming gift giving season, featuring my teenage ninja on a skateboard and about eight complete stories of her in this graphic novel available from Image Comics. You can also see how I make the other comics I make, like Plain Jane, Octobriana, and much more. All of that at patreon.com slash Jim Rugg. Hellboy Seed of Destruction, number one. So this is 1994, late 93, early 94 is when this comes out. You can see it's part of the Legend imprint from Dark Horse Comics. Uh, one of my final wizard uh, issues, Ed, was the big Legend preview, which was Frank Miller, John Byrne, Art Adams, uh, Paul Chadwick... Dave Gibbons, um, Jeff Darrow, Mike and Allred. then Mike Allred joins the team. And this is at a time, you know, after Image starts up and is so hot, several of these kind of like creator-owned imprints show up everywhere. Marvel has one with Epic, Malibu has one with Bravura, and uh, Dark Horse has one with Legend, and a pretty good lineup uh, of, of creators for Legend. You notice the Legend uh, imprint gets top billing above Dark Horse, and I do think that that's smart, uh, because at this time, like, what Dark Horse was to me... Licensed comics. Yes. Terminator, Predator, Aliens. Exactly. Uh, mo movie tie-in comics. And having that legend imprint, it, it just, it separates, the, uh, frankly, the wheat from the chaff with when where their brand is concerned, man. And uh, we're looking at, at a strong one. This right was here. a, uh, I think of this comic as transformative for Mike Mignola's sort of professional, certainly his legacy. But even the way he was perceived, um, you know, he had come from not exactly fitting with the Marvel DC slick superhero style, but that was the game. So that's where he was working and uh, much better suited to draw monsters and horror and all the stuff that's going to go into Hellboy. And Hellboy was sort of his chance to make the book you want to draw. He's transcended the sort of scary position one can find themselves in of being the... In our case, the artist's artist. What that often means is that other cartoonists absolutely dig your work. And the Wednesday Warrior, they're not really giving you the time of day. These kinds of cartoonists almost never transcend that. They almost never break out of that kind of box. Uh, for whatever reason, you know, they don't have their masterpiece work or, 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 or some, something that, like, makes other regular people kind of like just gravitate toward them hellboy as a character like it transcends you know mike mignola even and it got mike out of that position of being like the artist artist to where people were actually like really really you know the average cartoon the average uh, fan is paying more attention to to his work and you would hear and see so much evidence of other people in the industry absolutely loving and adoring his work but as kids i mean we were there as kids we we got that x-force comic right and it wasn't rob liefeld and it took me 30 days to get my next issue of x-force and i was very mad for, for 20 30 days 
That's funny. So, uh, it because it's so different. You know, we did that shoot interview with Dave Cooper. Dave, what was the moment you you uh, realized that you were in comics? The day I went to San Diego Comic Con, went to Mike McNeil's table to give him my comic, and he already had a copy, and then drew a backup for me. You know, it was Mike McNeil who uh, let Dave know that that he was in the game. You know, this is a very important creator. Yeah, no doubt about it. And and to me, it all it all changes like almost overnight with the publication of this comic book. You see his style creep in like throughout his career and maybe even some of that stuff that was like a little like uh, a little iffy as like a kid or whatever. It was because the final printed artwork wasn't communicating exactly what he wanted to communicate it. He was drawing it such a revolutionary kind of style that is inkers who are used to like accommodating to house style and conforming to house style they were doing what they could to kind of erase the Mignola-isms right. away from his work. Yeah, very, very unique vision. And before we crack this, I wanted to show, this is the collection of Seed of Destruction uh, for Jack Kirby, H.P. Lovecraft, uh, his wife, and the amazing Elmer Newton. Um, I mention this because I think the Jack Kirby and H.P. Lovecraft, uh, having that in mind as we dive into this, very informative of, of Hellboy and Hellboy's DNA. Oh, yeah. So let's dig in. You know, the first thing uh, to note probably is the creative team. It's not exclusively Mignola. It's Mignola on plot and art, John Byrne on script, uh, Mark Chiarello on colors, who colored the Jungle Adventure, the Wolverine Jungle Adventure that we looked at in a previous video. Might, might have colored the, uh, the Batman comic as well. He might have. Yeah, that's true. I'm not sure of the colorist on that one. Kevin Nolan logo design. This is another mark for me of the artist artist is like who these guys interact with. And I think of Nolan and, and Mike Mignola... Uh, in certain similar ways, very different styles, but I think both of those guys take great care in their art and it shows and it is unique. Um, I believe that Byrne is lettering this book. I was going to ask because the lettering is perfect for, uh, for this artwork, you know, uh, it doesn't, it, it's not the exact kind of, uh, it's not name or lettering. So Burn is pulling out a different, created a different kind of font. Right. He was like one of the first guys that I remember reading about who like, created his own typefaces. Yes. So one thing I like about this comic on the reread is it's really good as an issue one, I think. Totally. It introduces a whole lot of stuff without being too convoluted or too dense. But we start out back in World War II, the, the waning days of World War II, and you get this sort of tough guy sergeant describing, you know, what's going on here. They're sent to England where there's a group of Nazis doing some kind of occult thing. Uh, and it's big enough that the authorities are sending in some some big guns, whether it's commandos or the Torch of Liberty, like the Captain America, uh, a John Byrne. I think this is a John Byrne character, I believe, um, you know, lending himself here. And then the three occult uh, Western experts that are they're coming along. Look at that great use of red right there. You know, started with issue one. It's it's always been a hallmark of the series, man. That that you know that red color, man. You save that for Hellboy. There's some really nice coloring in this in this issue. So we're just getting some background on this occult vision and uh, cut to the Nazis in the not experiment, but I guess spell or whatever they're doing, the conjuring that they're trying to do here. This character, I don't think he's ever named, but he's basically Rasputin. Yeah. And uh, in a later issue, he talks about what Russians tried to do to him, throwing him in the frozen river, all this stuff that lines up with the Rasputin character. But here he's trying to basically bring forth these dark forces, um, something to, uh, you know, tip, tip the war in the Fuhrer's favor, or at least that's what the good Nazis around him think. But he's, he's looking at a bigger game, I think, like uh, Ragnarok and End Times and, and dealing with these Lovecraftian ancient the demons and gods. Yes. I adore this panel. Amazing. To me, this is such a... a a great example of a master cartoonist really composing a shot of huge impact. You know, this burst coming out. We have a crucifixion in the background and these little silhouette figures in the foreground to give it all scale. We talk a lot about his ability to do foreground, middle ground, background. This panel has all of that plus a great composition that shows that impact. And he's been working in color comics for, for quite some time at this point. And he knows that you could just like let color do the, the rest of the work uh, on, on that particular panel, it's a ballsy thing. And you don't like most cartoonists way too insecure to allow a panel like this to breathe, but it's perfect. And it's color comics. Maybe if it was just purely black and white, he would, he would have chosen something different, but 
you know, you make the bright color choice, you make this brighter, you know, this image does not dominate the whole page. And having these bottom heavy characters really sells the scale yes. of this thing. Yeah, exactly. Because I mean, they're close. These are the closest thing to us in the panel and they're tiny. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's really awesome. You know, what's neat about these, these color choices is, um, he does these big solid blacks, right? Where black is almost a color. Yeah. Then he treats color the same way. So these, these flat fields of uh, black or color, they're kind of the same where black is a color on these pages. Yeah. It doesn't always work that way, but... Uh, and this is the era of computer coloring, lens flares, radio blurs, all that stuff. And it's a very clear choice. We're not going to be doing that stuff in Hellboy. Just because you can doesn't mean that you do it. And he's worked with, I think Matt Hollingsworth did a turn in Hellboy for a bit, and then Dave Stewart for a long time, and who's got, I don't know, a dozen Best Colorist Eisner Awards on his shelf. And you often hear Mignola talk about, um, he works very closely with the colorists yeah. uh, on these projects. And saving your red for some impact, our first appearance of Hellboy here, and that red is popping. Yeah. And just like, you know, we did that one video on composition and stuff, and creating interesting compositions. He didn't have to make that tail come forward, but just by doing that, just adds an extra little, little bit of oomph to, yeah. to that sequence. And a, and a cool composition for a panel too. Yeah. You know, I mean, look how much empty space is in that bottom. It's it's really interesting. Yeah, and it's and it's a way to avoid having you know heads on the same scale. This is like an iconic shot to me that uh, is the image that I think of whenever I think of this issue. And you see a lot of like what Manuela is good at. Like just in this image alone, where he's popping stuff like these, like white helmets, and making sure to have black directly behind. So he, there's so many layers of black over white, black over white throughout this whole piece to just create a really, really, really pleasing composition as a whole. I always loved his organic brick and stone work. You know, simple lines, but that organic quality, I really loved it. And it was also like, hey, you don't have to use a ruler for all this stuff. Yeah. <laughs> kind of maybe maybe to the detriment overall of of us, but uh, it was kind of nice to be free of that. So one of the hallmarks of Hellboy are these kind of th things, scenes and settings that are just packed with books and details and 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 all of these little trinkets and stuff in the backgrounds. That's so cool seeing all of that stuff as we go on. That's where you get your love Lovecraftian stuff because you read enough uh, uh, Lovecraft or you know enough uh, art history, man, and those are uh, bas reliefs. It also brings to mind some of the Bernie Wrightson, like Frankenstein lab backgrounds. For sure. Where but it's just, just loaded with cool shit. He's just so good at like creating these believable old ornamental totems. And uh, great color once again, where we have this blue introduced because we're in a new scene and it's 30 years later. Let's uh, let's make it look different. And this feels like a guy right out of uh, Bram Stoker's Dracula, which Mignola had done the adaptation for, I don't know, a year or two before this. And gives that a lot of credit for the evolution of his style. And I think you see some of that, you know, using more of these heavy blacks leaning into that stuff. How's that for an interesting color for a flesh tone? Really great. And uh, really great for the cutting. This is almost your Alan Moore of like, how do you cut from panel to panel? Color being the device now that launches us into this flashback where uh, Br Professor Broom, is it Professor? Um, basically Hellboy's, you know, father type figure was on this expedition that, Things didn't go right. But man, getting into this, this always reminds me of uh, like Milt Kniff has that famous snow panel of the plane flying over the mountains. But beautiful. And just that little bit of blue to give you the shadow on the snow. Gorgeous. The blue is good. The black right there cutting like to let us know that this is a different peak. This is not a part of this right there, man. And, you know, one life to, I mean, one line to sell you on it. Yeah, really great stuff visually. These are deliberate lines, you know? Like, I feel like I could imagine if we saw the original of these pages that we would see, you know, this kind of line outlining these black shapes and then he fills in the color. You know what I'm saying? Like, he's not just dabbing the brush to make those shapes. <laughs> I've seen a lot of people talk about, like, you know, you see the white in there, like little little bits of white where, like, the black is not filling it in, like, you know, fill in your blacks perfectly. It's more of just kind of dabbing in that black, but it's something that I've seen people talk about in his art and how his blacks have that quality of, I don't, I don't know what, what to describe that as, but it's not like a just painting in the blacks. It's uh, It's not your paint bucket fill tool. Yeah, it's not. And, and like, 
you know, there's very few, like, true, true blacks in nature, you know, you need a full sort of vacuum to, with no light. So that's like a 99% gray. <laughs> <laughs> um, this, this story really moves along at a rapid pace. So, you know, we get the broom, there's something wrong with him, Hellboy's going to kind of investigate. We get the background, it's beautiful looking, but it's one page, and now we're inside of whatever they found in those mountains. Like, it, it moves quick. You know something? And gives lots of excuses for like, all right, get, get some of that Lovecraftian horror in there. He's a visual artist, man. This is a visually written thing. It said plotted by Mike Mignola, which meant that he's drawn a bunch of stuff he wants to draw, and uh, John Berm. Help me figure it out, man. And you know what? This is some of uh, the best John Byrne writing I've ever read. I agree. And I think it works. So I was almost out on Hellboy after the second miniseries. And uh, Conqueror Worm, I think, is the third one. And that's when I was like, I'm totally in. You know, to me, this is almost prototyping Hellboy. It's not exactly what Hellboy would become known for, but it's all there. And I think Byrne gets a lot of credit for that. You know, part of what makes this first issue so effective to me is his writing because there's just enough in there to give us backstory, characterization. Um, it just works really well as an issue one. The frogs are important when it comes to Lovecrafty and lore because if you read enough Lovecraft, you hear this term Betrachean a bunch. So then you got to Google that or look in your dictionary and see what the fuck Betrachean means. And it just means frog. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, kind of, kind of a, a sad scene here as uh, his mentor figure is falling apart mentally from whatever he was exposed to in the Arctic. Yeah, in perfect Lovecraftian fashion. Man, it's just, it all works. Like all the sparse drawing stuff, perfect for these French doors. And he had run through this into this other room, leaving Hellboy behind. No extraneous details here. You know, we go from this super busy cluttered office to like our focus is on the blackness of what's in that room, what's happening. And just these these papers sell, selling the suction of, uh, of our guy back there. Cutting that one piece of paper in front of the door, you know, that goes along with that composition exercise thing that, that, that we covered, you know, some time back, man, which is, it's way more pleasing of a design. Like, it creates that middle ground. It does. It's so subtly. Yeah, totally. Even the, um, like, this is your storytelling action, right? Hellboy, like, what's going on? And then the reveal. These little, I don't know what they are, bites or sores or something that affect the victims that fall to this, like, frog thing. <laughs> Pretty gross looking. Yeah, man, look at those wrists. So cool. Yeah. That's another really nice crop with Hellboy being the top part of Hellboy being cropped off. I think it's a good panel. And using his rapidograph to create the the feathered lines that we associate with comic book inking. You know, that's not like a flick of your right. one oh two or a brush or something. That's something a, that's that would fall line. away too. You know, as, as uh, time passes, it's one of those pieces that doesn't survive. But man, that's a pretty iconic one. The hunched over Hellboy hunting for his prey. I think it's interesting that the gun goes into the darkness. I don't know that he would do that the same way. I'm either. so glad you brought that up because I was going to say the same thing. Like, like he being a master of layering on the shapes, he would never do this. Like as he continues to develop that style and 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 figure all of that out. So like that is very glaring for for this thing. How cool is that? Love it. Right there. Having these black panel borders for a lesser cartoonist could get so dicey when it comes to tangents and creating confusing flow. You know, like when you have this kind of thing, you need these captions right here. You take these captions away and this could be Hellboy's silhouette. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's, there's, you're, you're playing with some high octane stuff that is not for amateurs. How, on these pages, man. How good does the red pop on here, too? So good. It's it's that's a pretty great uh, spread, you know, centerfold spread. And uh, again, issue one, like we're getting fights with monsters, we're getting some origin stories. There are relationships that are established. It's it's a lot of information, and yet it doesn't feel crowded. Yeah, that arm, like just this whole pose is so good. And like when you see stuff like this, and I saw it on some earlier Hellboy faces. There's a Kevin Nolan component to some of this stuff. Like, like, are they looking at the same stuff? Even this kind of face, there's like a Kevin Nolan 
piece of energy. Is there some ghost work being done? I mean, it all feels Mignola-ish. Right. But like, go back uh, two pages, one more. Some Kevin Nolan in those eyes, man. His killer croc or something. Yeah, I, I think you're right. And, you know, those guys did sort of bump into each other. Nolan inked Mignola on different stuff. I think he inked them on an alien story that, that Byrne might have written. Um, so they, they definitely, and, you know, did the logo. Like, obviously, they were they were in contact with each other to some extent. I look at that, and I think, like, uh, they both did some designs for the Batman animated series. You know, like, there's, there's places, I imagine, where those two, uh, you know, they've talked comics with each other. We've done very little kind of collaboration on that front. You've done, you've done inking professionally and stuff. And I wonder if, like, as a penciler, you, you, you hand something off. I remember Klaus saying whenever Chester brown like redrew that eight ball issue one cover he learned a lot about his own artwork seeing it reinterpreted mm -hmm. by a cartoonist he likes so if you're doing some pencils and then uh, you get a really cool effect you get a kevin nolan ink in you you, you you might learn some things i follow him on uh i think it's on instagram he's been posting a lot of like covers that he's done that go from sketch to pencils to inks to color uh, yeah, I learn a lot on Instagram just looking uh, at Kevin Nolan stuff. That's cool. Hey, these monsters are, th this frog monster is awesome. Yeah, it is. It's so simple and yet great. The teeth are great. The tongue, everything, the shape of that, th that monster just all works. The first of a, a long lineage of great Mignola Hellboy monsters. And I love this kind of stuff. Whenever he finally dispatches it, the monster's making its break and he shoots it. You know, like it's not going to get away from him. And uh, different color green for the blood. And whenever it falls, it's just bone shattering against the floor. You know, for a guy who is sort of minimal in a lot of ways or simple, he's very good at getting motion and weight into these drawings. Yeah, very much so. And also, it's so... it's. It's beautiful artwork that, like, it's a gunshot, but he does the whole scene without vulgarity, you know? Like, you see an open wound right there, but, you know, that's not Red Room. <laughs> no, it isn't. <laughs> <laughs> I love the burn, uh, pan the captions. What falls from the top of the commode is a frog monster. What hits the floor isn't. <laughs> this is good John Byrne writing. It's pretty good, you know? He's not showboating or anything. It, it, it all works for me. Mignola is great at architecture too. Whether it's an old medieval castle or some like institute for the Bureau of Paranormal Research and Defense, and how great is that for a concept to throw in issue one? It's such a cool idea. It sounds good. I love that defense is part of the name of the institution. Good, good stuff, man. You know, th th those couple of words say a lot. Yeah, Jason Wynn work, working at the uh, bureau, man. Let's get that. Let's get that spawn crossover. This is another place where, like, your exposition allows some characterization and to fill out that universe more. He's like, "Yeah, you're free to assemble your own team, as always, letting us know that Hellboy not only works for this institution but is well respected within this world." Well, we got to introduce Abe Sapien and crew next issue, man. I think. Yes, that's exactly where we go. Uh, but of course, we've got to do a creepy haunted house and an old lady with her with her frog in the teacup. Feels perfect for a Hellboy comic. Yeah. Yeah, it's all there, man. It's it's pulpy. You know, it has some of those superhero tropes, and I don't know if that's Mignola still kind of, you know, figuring out what this is going to be, or if it's a little bit of John Byrne bringing what he knows about monthly comic books into it, but it creates kind of this pulpy uh, character that I think defines the the what Hellboy does the rest of his existence as a character so much of it is here on the page in issue one that's rare oh totally yeah I mean go go hit our issue one uh pl playlist uh you gotta have your watchmen like back matter after 1986 happens man so you gotta have your little piece of that this is beautifully graphically designed mm -hmm. man good typeface for that in, in you know many fonts like uh like an askew kind of typeface where the characters are a little wobbly, you know, I think that's a little kayfabe, you know, that it's not like you just use an old typewriter to do that. It's much better than most of the type fonts that you'll see. So much uh, better. That are used. These so days. much better, man. Yeah, pass as well. Um, the BPRD logo already figured out and looks good yeah, from man. the beginning. Yeah, all of these pictures are, are excellent, though. It's it just, it's a good package. We'll, we'll save Monkey Man and O'Brien, but it is worth, uh, I mean, maybe just read that verbatim, dude. Yeah, this is a note from John Byrne. So, Mike Mignola is a nut. Take a gander at some of the work he's produced in the last few years. World of Krypton, Cosmic Odyssey, Fafford and the Grey Mouser, Iron Wolf, Dracula, Gotham by Gaslight. Not too shabby, huh? And now Hellboy, which he asked me to script, 
which is why he's a nut. He's already making up the stories and giving me enough in the liner notes that I'm only a few inches ahead of being a mere transcriber. I love working on this book, but I'm taking wagers on how long it will be before Michael realizes he can put words in the characters' mouths just as easily as I can. I bet four issues top, tops, you read it here first. And uh turns out to be prophetic. I believe yeah. that four issues is exactly how long Byrne lasts uh, scripting this. But why not? You know, um, He trusts Byrne enough to, hey, put the words on the page for me. He's building a world here. Like, you know, for a first-time writer, why not have somebody along to just kind of co-pilot and, and make sure you, you dot those I's and cross your T's the way you want to? And I think it, it fits. I think it's a really good merger between words and pictures in this issue. Yeah, I mean, this is that very weird period where there were so few writer-artists. You could probably count them all on, on one hand at a certain point, man. Like, it's like, you know, you Frank Miller, your Walt Simonson, Kirby did it, Howard Chaikin, but... but you know, yeah. less than 10 guys. So so we had circumscribed jobs. Uh, you, you're a penciler. You're, he, might, he didn't even get to ink his own stuff for a bunch of years. And by the way, the guys who were trying this, exact stunt, all the image guys, they're getting crushed for how bad their <laughs> writing is. So of course you're going to be a little trepidatious uh, getting into that. And you know cartoonists. Like we're all self-conscious about this. And, you know, it's, that's a big thing to, to jump into. Um, add here for John Byrne's Next Men Power miniseries, which is also part of that legend imprint. And I pulled out uh, Hellboy 2 just as a, you know, part of the, I feel like, cartoonist Season kayfabe eight. world. They added Mike Allred shortly after Legend started. He comes to Dark Horse and they make Madman part of the Legend uh, family. I was shocked to see this ad with an Alex Toth quote, who we know of as being very critical of like poor Steve Rude and a lot of others. But glowing praise for Allred here. Fun, riding along, professional, prolific, clean, clear, literary, and simple, well-staged, thought-out storytelling art with gestural gems. High praise, man, from from uh, Alex Toth to Mike Allred and Madman. Um, I think that was the last of the guys that they added to the Legend lineup. I can't remember. Stan Sakai maybe was... See, there's Maverick that comes after, and okay. Stan Sakai is definitely a part of Maverick. Don't know about this. Yeah. Don't know about legend. You know, again, a snapshot. You know, what's going on at the time? You see the sequel to uh, Martha Washington there. I think some of the first Hellboys show up in uh, in Next Men, actually. Issues like 14 or something, maybe? And, uh, again, snapshot Bravura, of the baby. time. Bravura, uh, where Walt Simonson, you know, has, has aligned. I think there was talk at some point of him being part of legend, but uh, had already, already aligned with another one of these imprints. And... Uh, the other piece for Hellboy is coming out right as comics are about to nosedive into, you know, that 90s collapse, and yet Hellboy thrives. Um, you know, given the platform and what he's able to bring to this comic pages, one of the great successes of 90s com one of the great successes of comics, period, but to come out of the 90s period, like, he's, not very many of them came out of that period. He stuck it out. Comics was at one of its worst ebbs in, in, in our lifetime. But he stuck it out and was able to rise above all the crap that was out there, man, and produce a reliable, you know, solid book in the midst of all that nonsense, you know? He did those little Hollywood tours that probably, you know, like, offset maybe some money that he was, like, barely making or even losing with the comics, right. man. But he's a cartoonist, you know, and, and, and stuck with the game. I pulled this out. This is the Seed of Destruction trade paperback. He would always have extras in his trades. And uh, here it's like evolution of Hellboy. So starts as a convention sketch that adds Hellboy to the belt buckle just at the last minute. Uh, but you see some stuff, some horns there, some of that big upper body. Uh, this was the early team idea for Hellboy. And Abe Sapien very formed in, oh, yeah. this, in this early team. Didn't have a name for them yet. And um, pretty much Hellboy as we know him for, uh, I think this was a convention program cover or a poster or something. But uh, the other thing that they print in here are his two first appearances that predated it. And I think we look at this in one of the artist editions that we look at of his. But San Diego Comic-Con program book, I believe this appeared in. And I'm not sure where this one went. But uh, he said one thing he learned from these two is Hellboy looks good in a coat. <laughs> <laughs> but... You know, again, at this point, fully formed and just kind of doing a couple of a uh, couple of fights. You know, do your four-page Hellboy story for whatever promo, and uh, you know, definitely drop that Seed of Destruction is coming the next year. Yeah, super cool, man. Fun to revisit this thing. It's been a while since I dusted off this comic. I I'll tell you, it's one of those comics better 
than I remembered. Ah, that's cool. So, very fun to get into it. Kayfabers, like, follow, subscribe to the YouTube channel, hit the bell, we'll notify you when new vids are available. What's out there, Jimmy? Join me on Patreon.com slash Jim Rug, where you can download my out-of-print zines and mini-comics. You can see a lot of my original art, scripts, process, layouts, how I make comics like Street Angel, Deadliest Girl Alive, Plain Janes, Octobriana, and more at Patreon.com slash Jim Rug. Red Room Comics in the Wild, Murder on the Dark Web for Fun and Profit, the Anti-Social Network trade paperback, hit in shops November 9th. Get it at your local comic store, order it from the Fantagraphics website. When all else fails, you go to Amazon.com. Com. They bought half the print run, so they'll be sitting on a couple of copies for a little while. Uh, you can uh, pre-order the next round of Red Room Comics, though, directly from Fantagraphics at this moment. Uh, put in the orders at your local comic shop as well. Trigger Warnings is the name of that series. And uh, two issues are available pre for pre-order uh, right this minute. All these links are in my link tree in the description below this video. Subscribe to the Cartoonist Kayfabe e-newsletter at the links below this video. You can also find Cartoonist Kayfabe t-shirts and merchandise at the links below this video. Jimmy, give them those marching orders, man. We're going to be on our way. Read more comics.